at Agape, I just feel it's not, you know, just a church where you walk in and you leave and no one notices. Um, I really feel like the people here are family and um, it's something that we're always hanging out together, we're always doing life together. So Agape is really a family-oriented church, you know. It's not a service that you just come to and, you know, get your word and then leave. So you come, you know, you meet people, you greet them, you all like get along well and you, you get in the Word of God together and then you go out and fellowship together. From the time we stepped in to the time we left, we were just overwhelmed with people. Just people fellowship, people welcoming us, people making us feel very comfortable, very much at home, very much like we were one. My favorite part about being in Agape is that um, I've never really heard the gospel the way that I've heard it here. And so it's different and it's just it's just so wonderful and it really it just really fills my soul. So I, I like this and I've not seen it anywhere else. My favorite thing about Agape is being able to serve and and help with the community and help with the church. Um, and I think just being able to, to serve and be in that spirit of service is, is the best part of being a part of the church. I think Agape is the greatest sense of family that you can get and uh, it's just a great sense of community that holds you accountable and really helps you grow in your faith and and also it's just a great group to be around and they're constantly just uh, supporting you. So at worship I play the drums and uh, so that I really enjoy that and I also uh, love being part of the band and it's a great, great time. So what I love about this church is the community and that we're all so close and always there for one another. Um, whenever someone's going through a rough time, you have like everyone there as a big community of sisters and brothers. I think that people should come and visit Agape because we have such an incredible, incredible and diverse group of people here. We have people from all over the world, all over the country, all over Texas, from different walks of life, different ages, and we all come together for one purpose, and that's to serve God and love each other. So I think it's a place that anyone can call home. Loving fellowship. Community. Family. Worship. Church. Love. Agape. Oh. Agape. 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 Hope everybody is doing well. That's all stand up together and just bow our heads as we begin our service and just welcome God into this place. Lord, we thank you for being here with us. We thank you for who you are and what you've done for us day by day. We thank you for this place where we can come and worship you, Lord. We give you our hearts and minds as we sing for you this morning. May your name be praised among your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Good to see you all. Let's worship together. Here we go. One, two. Standing here in your presence in a grace so relentless, I am one by perfect love. Wrapped within arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, sinking deep in mercy. See, I'm wide awake, drawing close, stirred by grace and all my heart is yours all fear removed I breathe you in lead into your heart oh your My head, see. 
so beautiful. Here in you, I find shelter, captivated by the splendor of your face. My secret place, and wide awake, drawing closer by grace.
just as we are, Lord, broken, hopeless, coming to you, Lord, seeking for your words to give us hope and peace and, and love and reassurance in who you are, Lord. May we listen to your word in attentiveness, Lord, and eager to what you have to say for us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God is good, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody doing good today? Praise God. Let's see, what do we want to talk about this morning? Camille, you want to preach? Well, I had, I had a message, but uh, this morning I awakened, and I had these thoughts. And I was thinking a couple of things, but who does Jesus help? Who does Jesus help? Does he help everyone? Does he help anyone? How about as a believer? When does he help you? I'm going to approach it a little differently from where we're going to go. But I, I noticed several times in, in the Word of God, Jesus does what I would not think that he would do. And I, I believe it's sometimes it's not until we call out or we really want him that we receive what he has for us. Well, even think about it like this. Does God's will always take place? It's his will that none should perish, correct? But do some perish? Okay, so, so without getting into detail, th think about this. Because sometimes the way I was raised as Muslim, it, it was more of a religion of fate. You know, inshallah, whatever will be, will be. But uh, that's not how it is with the Lord. For, for instance, re remember, Mordecai tells Esther, deliverance is going to come for the Jews. He believes he's placed in the king she's placed in the kingdom for, f to be used at that time, for such a time as this. But if she doesn't, deliverance is still going to come. So though God has an individual moral will for each one of us, we have to cooperate with God for it to take place. Now, God's still going to accomplish his sovereign will, but if you don't want to do it, God will find someone else. Amen? Uh, remember uh, when uh, King Saul was disobedient and Samuel comes to him and he says, you, you fool, if you had obeyed the Lord God and his command, he would have established your kingdom forever. But he didn't. But God, he found a man after his own heart, David. So God still established the kingdom that he wanted, but it was through another man. So uh, I want to, because sometimes we think, oh, God's will is going to take place but not in our own individual lives and we, unless we cooperate with God. So I see there's a time that we can and cannot. And, and you know, someone I greatly admired, Billy Graham, went to heaven this week. So you know, I, I want to preach the gospel here because I, I thought if, if I pass, I think, I, I'm not planning on leaving anytime soon. But if I was going to, I, I think I'd prepare a video ahead of time if God let me. So I, I would do my own funeral. Is that legal? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> So what got my attention is, and where should we start? I've jotted down some notes. In Luke 24, Jesus has now been resurrected. And I'm going to, read, I'm going to go ahead and read this. These are two of Jesus' disciples on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. They're pretty downcast. And, and I'm going to start somewhere... Where's the road to Emmaus? Help me out here. Okay, thank you. There you go. At that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but kept them from recognizing him. They didn't realize it was Jesus. He asked them, what, what, are you dis, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, 
you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They said he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to, to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they'd seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things that concerning things concerning himself. I would love to have been in that conversation. I mean, think Moses and all the prophets. See, Jesus is in every book of the Bible. Amen. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. And this sentence, I read it. 30 years ago, I thought, what? Jesus acted as if he were going on. Did you hear that? Jesus acted. They stopped, they get to their destination, the two disciples, and Jesus acted like he was going to keep going. So he would have, or was he just acting? But listen to this. But they begged him, another translation I read this morning said, they urged him, they begged him, to stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them, sat down to eat, took the bread, blessed it, then he broke it, gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and at that moment he disappeared. And then they said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour they were on their way back to Jerusalem, and they go and share the news with disciples. But think about this. Jesus acted as he, was, as he was going on. And because they called out, because they begged, because they urged, he stayed. And I'm wondering, do you think the Lord does that with us today? He can be in the midst of our presence, and maybe he's just casting by, and do we, do we cry out? Do we really want him? Do we want his, his presence? Do we want his wisdom? Do we want his instruction? And, and so I, I'm just throwing these out, because we're going to see something at the end here. So you, you, you might think that's the only time something like that happens, but um, what was I going to... Well, let's just go to the scripture. Look at Mark chapter 6. Here, uh, verse 30, you know, it starts the passage where actually Jesus feeds the 5,000. Remember that story? And then I'm going to jump all the way to verse 45. Now, he's just fed the 5,000. He used the disciples to distribute the, the fish and the bread. And they saw the miracle and the, the baskets left over. And immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to, to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves about three o'clock in the morning. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them. What does, does anybody have that? What does your translation say? Any? Tell me, I, I need some help right now. In verse 48, towards the end of verse 48, the last sentence, my translation said he intended to go past them. Anybody else have anything? He would have passed them by. So do you see, do you see this? Listen, you, it's quite often, it's interesting when God reveals or shows you something in the Word, all of a sudden you'll see it everywhere in the Word. It's, I believe the Lord's trying to speak to us. So, so they're struggling. Jesus, got, he's walking on the water, and he would have passed them by. With the disciples on Emmaus, he, he, he would have kept going. 
Uh, but it's not until there's a cry, till you a desire, a need. Here it was out of fear, but because of that, Jesus ends up getting in. A, this translation says, the, the, "He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on water, they cried out in terror, thinking it was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once: 'Don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. He climbed into the boat. The wind stopped. They were totally amazed." For they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their heart was too hard to take it in. That's a whole other message, but, but think about this. First of all, why was there fear? Here it says they didn't remember, take, remember the significance of the loaves. I think a better, better translator, they hadn't considered the miracle that Jesus had just done. And let me just share this. Don't ever forget what God does in your life. You hear what I say? You need to recall and remember what God has already done in your life. In Psalm 106, remember they crossed the Red Sea, it split up. Well, let me just turn to it real fast. It's okay we just ramble a little? Because we're going somewhere. Psalm 106, just listen to this. So He commanded the Red Sea to dry up. He led Israel across the sea like a desert. He rescued them from their enemies, redeemed, redeemed them from their foes, the waters returned, covered their enemies. Not one of them survived. Then his people believed his promises and they sang his praise. Did you catch that? Always believe what God has done. Give praise and thanks. But the next verse just kind of blows me away. Verse 13. After they believed his promises and sang his praise, the next verse says, Yet how quickly they forgot what he had done. Are you kidding me? And so what does the next sentence say? So they wouldn't wait for his counsel. Listen, when we don't recall, remember what God has done, let me share something. You won't wait for his counsel and instruction for the next step in your life. You need to remember what he has done. Recall what he has done. Give praise and thanks. And don't, that's why sharing your testimony is an awesome thing to do. When you share your testimony, remember what God has done, it'll cause you to pause and wait, okay, God, what do you have for me now? Because then they cried out for what he didn't want them to have, and, and they got it, but with it, they got leanness of soul, and we don't want to go there. That's a whole other message, but you can run with that if you like. But here they are in the boat struggling. Jesus is going to pass them by, but because they cried out, Jesus joins them. So think of in your own life right now. Are there areas you're struggling with? Areas you're, you're anxious about? Are, you know, with uh, relationships or health or family or finances or future? Are, are there areas in your life and are you taking it and just pausing to, to acknowledge God, even in prayer of thanksgiving, where his peace not only guards your heart and your mind, but how many of you want God to intervene in your situation? Listen, I, I had a gentleman call me from another part of Texas, and I, in a nutshell, this guy was ready to take his life. He was there. It, I could tell. He said he was done, and he's hundreds of miles away. I said, okay, Lord. But as I prayed with him on the phone, I used one word, God, would you intervene in his life today? And I called back next few days, nothing. I got a message from him yesterday. He said God intervened in his life and saved him from taking his own life. But do we really call out, do we, do we really cry out in situations? And, 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 and think, think about this a second. Um, re, remember the woman with the issue of blood? You know, she... 12 years been sick and, and watch this. She was thinking and saying, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be, I'll be healed. If I just, and if, if you look at it, Jesus is, uh, what had happened, Jairus had just come to Jesus, said, my, my, my little girl is near death. If you come touch her, I know she will live. You hear that? So Jesus goes with him. And as Jesus goes with Jairus, there's a massive crowd following him. I mean, so Jesus is walking. And what happens, this woman, this unclean woman, this outcast who shouldn't be out there, is saying, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. So maybe she, she gets to the crowd and maybe hides herself so people don't recognize her. And maybe she gets through the crowd and, and as she touches the hem of his garment, it says immediately, virtue left Jesus. And she found, all of a sudden she realized she, she, she was healed. And Jesus, with this crowd, all of a sudden he stopped and he said, who touched me? And the disciples, are you kidding me? Everybody's touching you. No, but so, see, somebody really wanted it. Somebody called it out. Somebody pulled it out of her, out of him. And see, Jesus answers those who really cry out with expectation, cry out in faith. 
Because think about this. Jesus didn't stop to heal her. And I mentioned this last time. He did not stop to heal her. She stopped him in his tracks because there was a cry, a cry of faith. And if, you, and if we jumped over to Mark chapter 10, remember blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus? He's blind outside by the road of Jericho, and, and he's begging for alms. And, and, and it says, as Jesus was leaving, or coming, he, so he's with his disciples going by, walking through the city. He's not stopping. He's just walking by. And blind Bartimaeus finds out it's Jesus of Nazareth, and he cries out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And watch what happens when you call out in expectancy. Here he is hoping to something, but the people around him told him to be quiet, to shut up. And sometimes our life experiences, fear, doubt, unbelief, failures from the past, we think one worthy, we cry out, and we think, oh, nothing happened, we think that's it. And the voices around him told him to be quiet. And many voices will try to keep you from crying out for the living God. Situation, circumstance, what has happened in life, and maybe even those that are just closest to you, because they don't they don't know the, the dream or the purpose God has in your own life. And as you cry out, no, no, that's this is your lot in life. But it's as he cried out, he has to determine what's he gonna do. Listen to the voices or to the promise in his heart. And it says he cried out even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus is walking with us, and all of a sudden it says, Jesus stood still, Jesus stopped. Do we cry out to where Jesus stops? Do we just breathe a quick prayer? Or do we really passionately want him in our lives? It says, Jesus, I mean, people all around, and Jesus stopped for that one man. Bring him to me. And as he heals him, he says, your faith is healed. You go your way. And he follows Jesus. And listen, when Jesus does a miracle, you better keep following him. Amen? So and time and time again, I'm seeing in the word, where Jesus is just passing by. He's walking through. If Jesus came through right now and walked out that door, what would you do? Oh, I wouldn't listen to me. I'd follow him, right? But it's interesting. When they brought blind Bartimaeus to Jesus, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? What if Jesus asked you that question right now? Listen, don't, we can't be presumptuous. Because, I mean, Peter would say, God, the guy's blind. What do you think he wants? But no, 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 no. Because I think sometimes we limit God, whether it's experience or religion or just our own unbelief. The blind man could have said, well, uh, uh, if you just give me enough food for the day, I won't have to beg. Or if you give enough money, I won't have to keep begging. But no, he, how big is your God? He says, Lord, I, I want to see. And he got what he wanted. So do we really cry out? Do we call? And I, and I thought about this. Does Jesus just walk by today? You know, Jesus was only one person. Isn't that true? What did he tell his disciples in John 14, I believe? He says, it's better that I go. <laughs> that didn't make sense to me, right? It didn't make sense to them. Why? Because he, he what's he saying? Because I will send you a comforter that will never leave you. You hear what I'm saying? Because Jesus could come and go, right? They could come and go. They could get but the, the, he says, I'll give you a comforter that will never leave you. So think about this. Do we need to cry out to God today for him to stop? I mean, he's, is he not living in us? Let me see. Here, come on. Come on up here, my brother. I'm going to do this in a nutshell. I know you see this a million times, but once you get it, then this place will be full. Okay, so, so stand right here. I, I want you to see this because uh, I'll do the two-minute version, okay? In the beginning was God, holy, righteous, clothed in glory. He creates man in his image. What was the purpose we were created for? We were created for fellowship, for relationship, for intimacy. As man disobeyed God, man died in that relationship, a spiritual death. Because that disobedience becomes sin in the life of man. And he can no longer have relationship with holy God because all have sinned fallen short of God's glory. Now watch this. But this daddy, Jehovah God, still wants relationship with man, so he sets up sacrifice, particularly on the Day of Atonement. You remember the story, right? And if God accepted the sacrifice, he allowed that blood for a season to cover our sin. Why? So that daddy God could do, because this is, this is what we were created for. 
Listen, there's a gospel, but there's an original purpose was relationship with God. So he made a way, even in the Old Covenant, through sacrifice. But man kept sinning, continual sacrifice, sacrifice. And then God in his wisdom sends the perfect sacrifice. He sends the Lamb of God, his son, Jesus Christ. You know the story, right? And I think because maybe because of Billy Graham. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen? So, so watch. So Jesus, the son of God, comes as the lamb, crucified, dead and buried and raised from the dead. And God takes the blood of his son Jesus and does he cover our sin? No. The lamb of God doesn't cover. What does he do? He, he takes away the sin of the world. Now, he wants to cover us. And what's it say about Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5? He who knew no sin, he actually what? Became sin. And he became sin so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. Now, watch this. Jesus became sin, no sin in him. Rose from the dead, he overcame hell, sin, death, and the grave. Amen? And he seals he seals eternal life. Ephesians says we're sealed unto the day of redemption. Jesus says nobody can snatch you from my hand. Amen? So, so watch this. So your sins are taking, but let me ask you, the, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, free gift, free gift. Are you kidding me? This is a gift, and it's free. Eternal life, salvation, righteousness. But God doesn't force it on anyone. Why? Because it is a gift, and a gift must be received. Now, God offers this gift to the whole world. Correct? But each one of us must receive this gift for ourselves. Mom, dad, pastor, preacher, teacher. Nobody can receive this for me nor for you. I must receive and you must receive. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, have you received this gift? Number two, this is really key. How do you receive this gift? How do you start this relationship where God is your father, Jesus is your Lord? And you'll hear a lot of teaching, but I like Romans 10. And you can read 9 and 10, mouth and heart. Can you all say mouth and heart? What it says, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in my heart, God raised him from the dead. The Bible says that I would be saved. What does that mean, saved? It means I received the gift of salvation. How? It's a belief and it's a confession. And the moment you do that, it's sealed. So right now, if he dropped dead, he'd go to heaven. That's good news, right? But I have more good news. Hopefully that won't happen today. <laughs> Why? Well, and listen, because God has a plan and purpose for our life. So watch what happens. Jesus doesn't walk by anymore because he sent us the Holy Spirit. And what happens when you say yes to Christ? Now God, by his spirit, comes to live inside of you. You're now called the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God. Watch this. You're a new creation from the inside out. He calls you the righteousness of God in Christ. And catch these words. He said he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Why? Yes, he wants to walk within you and live inside of you, but the bottom line, he has called us to grow in this relationship in such a way, what? That we are light to this world, that we are ambassadors for Christ. If I could, as a matter of fact, let me read a passage that many of you would know. It's uh, the end of Matthew. It's called the Great Commission. Right? Listen to this. Then Jesus told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Did you catch that? Listen, why is the Lord with us always? Yes, to fulfill his purpose in our life, but a major part of that purpose is what? It's so that the nations can know who he is. Why are we still here? Because there's people here that don't know him yet. Let me ask you, where you're seated today, what you're driving, how you drove here, where you live, of all those things, what are you taking to heaven with you? Anything? You're going to take your wallet? You're going to take your car? Your home? What's the only thing we're taking to heaven? It's people. That's why, so, so watch. I, I, I kind of led you on there. Jesus is walking by. But that's when he was by himself or didn't have the Holy Spirit for us yet. When he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit so that he doesn't want why he now comes to live inside of us. So I want you to picture. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Why? 
so that as we walk in this life, we touch other people for eternity and for the kingdom of God. So I just want to ask you something, because I know life goes on, correct? I know we have to deal with family, okay? I got six kids and a bride, okay? I know we have to deal with finances, with relationships, with plans, with work, with job, career, correct? But why? Because God has ordered our steps that where we live, where we work, where we come and go, there's people that still need to know him. So I, I want to ask you this. Do you allow his light to shine through you? Do you see through his eyes? Do, do you live in the light of eternity? I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a shooting at a, a high school. Do you think those kids were planning on dying that day? None of us are planning on dying today, but our days are numbered. When we go, we're out of here. As a matter of fact, our time here is a puff of vapor. And the cares of the, if we get too focused on this life, let me share something with you. It'll choke the word out of us. I saw it happen with me and my bride when I got so concerned about, you know, a vehicle. And God reminded me, he said, listen, son, your name's written in heaven. You better rejoice in that and share that with this world. If I seek him first, he takes care of all the other things in my life. So just where you're, and listen, I, I always want to leave you encouraged. Number one, have you actually received this gift? <laughs> and we'll pray at the end, because once you do, you have eternal life. Number two, are you growing in this relationship? Are you allowing the Lord, the Word, to transform your life to be more like Jesus? And then number three, are you letting his light shine? He said, you're the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth. He called us ambassadors for Christ. And what's amazing to me, you guys are so precious. I'm one of the most loving congregations I've, I've ever been with. But I want to ask you, are you sharing that love with this world? I see it within the body. But are you reaching out? Do you even just invite people? Just invite people here. That's how my life started, a simple invitation. Do you bless people? Do you, do you ask people if you can pray for them when they're struggling? You'd be amazed if you don't, they have nothing to do with God, but when they're struggling, all of a sudden they're open for prayer. I've seen more Muslims be interested in the gospel as even though we may be a little confrontational, but when I find out my, 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 Muhammad's daughter Fatima is having surgery, Muhammad, would you mind if I pray for her? Man, let me tell you, walls come down. So ask God to give us his heart, not just to see him, but to see as he sees. Because the only thing we're taking to heaven is people. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Your amazing love. Lord, it's amazing to me the love that you've lavished on us that we could actually become your sons and daughters as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would so seal this in our heart. We know that you never leave us. You never forsake us. That our names are written in heaven. But Lord, there is a world that doesn't know all of this yet. And the amazing thing to me, Lord, is that you're not proclaiming it from the heavens or, or the skies, but you've instilled in us the greatest, the greatest work that any man can do on the earth. And that share your love, your good news, your life to this world. And Lord, it's not by might or power. It's only by the Spirit of God. Lord, you said no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. But Lord, we see now the Spirit is in us. Your Holy Spirit is in us. So you have chosen us this day to proclaim, to love, to invite, to bless those around us that they might taste and see the goodness of God that's in Jesus and Jesus alone. So Lord, would you put in our hearts a passion not only to see you, but to see as you see. Lord, even as we go through, through the, <laughs> the cares of life, may you open our eyes to see people that still need you. And Lord, I, I believe each one of us 
when we see your face, we want to hear the words, well done. Well done. So Lord, take us from where we are now to reach and touch this world with your love. Lord, not by might or power, but I pray for us as a body, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in us and through us and for the glory of God. And before I close, I, you can keep your heads bowed, but I, I forget, this, I think you video, sometimes it's on the internet. May, may, maybe you're watching and listening and you realize that you, you, you desire, you want this eternal life, you, you want this Lord and God Jesus in your life. You, you want to be forgiven of your sin. You just pray this prayer right, right where you are. Just pray it in your heart. Say, uh, dear God, I, I know you created me and you created me for a love relationship with you. But I know my sin has separated us, Lord. And God, you love me so much. You sent your own son, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God. And he died on the cross. And he took all of my sin. And God, I believe in my heart that you, you actually raised Jesus from the dead. And I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I, I repent. I repent of all my sin and I make you the Lord of my life. I receive you, Jesus, into my life. And I receive your gift of salvation. I, I receive your gift of eternal life. And Lord, I may not understand it all, but I receive your gift of righteousness. Now, Lord, according to your word, God, you are now my heavenly Father. Jesus, you are now my Lord. And, and I am saved. Now, Lord, I know you have a plan and a purpose for my life. And I need your help. So, Lord, according to your word, I ask you, fill me with your spirit and give me the power, the power to know, to know you, to grow with you, the power to love you, and Lord, the power to be your witness in this world. Lord, fill me with that power. Fill me with that courage. And Lord, through my life, may your light shine and touch people everywhere I go. Lord, by the grace of God and in the name of Jesus, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.